for our scripture reading this morning. We're reading from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him and clasped his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee where they will see me there. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hear these words from St. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm be sharing uh, from the message. Friends, let me go over the message with you one final time. This message that I proclaimed and that you made your own. This message on which you took your stand and by which your life has been saved. The first thing I did was place before you what was placed before me that the Messiah died for our sins exactly as the scripture foretold. And that he was buried, that he was raised from the dead on the third day, exactly as the scripture says, that he presented himself alive to Peter, then to his closest followers, and later to more than 500 of his followers, and most of them are still alive although some have died. That he then spent time with his brother James and the rest of those that he had commissioned to represent him, and then finally he presented himself to me. Now let me ask you something profound yet troubling. If you became followers because you trusted the proclamation that Jesus is alive, risen from the dead, then how can you let people say that there is no such thing as the resurrection? If there is no resurrection, then there is no living Christ. And if there is no resurrection for Jesus, then everything that we have told you is smoke and mirror. And everything that you have staked your life on is a lie. Not only that, but we would be guilty of telling a string of barefaced lies about God. All these affidavits that we passed on to you, verifying that God raised up Christ, all sheer fabrications if there is no resurrection. And if Christ has not been raised from the dead, 
that all that you are doing is wandering in the dark, lost as ever. But the truth, the truth is that Jesus Christ has been raised up, the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries. My friends, if God's power stops at the cemetery, then why do we keep doing things that suggest that he's going to clean the place out someday, pulling everyone up on their feet alive? No, brothers and sisters, it is always the resurrection that undergirds all that we do and say. It undergirds the way that we are called to live. So don't let yourselves be poisoned by all this anti-resurrection talk. Remember, a bad company ruins good manners. So stand your ground. Be confident in your faith. Work for your master and live for him. After all, Jesus is alive. Let's pray. Lord, what a joy it is to stand up in your church this morning and proclaim the Easter message. I pray that you will give each person here in this sanctuary fresh ears to hear the message. That you would not only open up our ears, but our hearts and our souls so that we can leave this place going out and sharing the message that indeed Jesus is alive. Come, Holy Spirit, sit with us, move us. We ask this in your name. Amen. So what does Easter mean to you? That was a question that a Sunday school teacher asked her second grade class. And finally, one little boy raised his hand, and she said, Timmy, what does Easter mean to you? And he said, with a smile, egg salad sandwiches for the next two weeks. (laughs) Okay, that's not a good answer, is it? But it sure is a good question. What does Easter mean to you and to me? How has Easter changed our lives? Throughout the ages, the church has called the Sunday after Easter, Low Sunday. Easter is, after all, the highest point in the Christian year. And after such a high day in our lives, there is what behavioral scientists call a post Reinforcement pause. Simply put, that the Easter following, the Sunday following the celebration of Easter is a rather low time. But I want to ask you this morning, the church, if we are serious about celebrating Easter and the resurrection then there should never be a low Sunday in the church any time of the year. This Easter Sunday isn't the end of the church's high holy days. Brothers and sisters, it's the beginning of God sharing the impossible with us. It's just the beginning. In Matthew's Gospel, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary made their way to Jesus' tomb early on the first day of the week. We know, because we know the story, that these women had stayed near Jesus as he suffered and died on the cross. They had watched as Joseph, Arimathea, and Nicodemus took Jesus' body down from the cross anointed his body with spices, and then wrapped him in a linen shroud and placed him in the tomb. 
And yes, they were there as the stone was rolled in front of the tomb, sealing it. But as faithful and as loyal followers, they still had one holy duty to perform, and that was to mourn the death of their friend. We know a lot about mourning, don't we? A lot of us are still mourning the death of our loved ones. I thought driving down that this is the first Easter that my mom has been in heaven. And she loved Easter. How happy she is. But her family and some of her friends that are left in this world are still mourning her death. And we also know by the scriptures that the Sabbath was quickly coming. Even as they hurried to get Jesus' body entombed before the sunset, the women, although they had remained as long as they could, they had to get back to their homes. They had to get back to their families because they had to get ready for the celebration of Passover. And their mournings and their expressions of sadness and grief and love for their master would have to be put on hold until the Sabbath had passed. And when Sunday came, the women could not wait. They would not wait any longer. Matthew tells us that the two Marys made their way to the tomb not to greet the risen Christ, but to wail and weep and grieve. It was the last thing they would do for Jesus. After all, he was dead. But instead of a quiet time at the tomb, the women experienced an earthquake. A dazzling, radiant angel sent from God. A miraculous pronouncement and an empty tomb. With one quick glance inside the tomb, their agenda of life instantly changed, and so did their lives. It no longer was a time to mourn, my friends. It was no longer an ending. All of that had been changed into a bright new hope, a bright new world. A world in which the resurrection is a reality. A world in which sin and death has been overcome and conquered. And a world in which Jesus lives forever. So what does that mean for you and me? Some of you might remember a few years ago when our youth, maybe some of you, I did, wore a bracelet that had WWJD on it. Y'all remember that? What would Jesus do? And we would ask that question of ourselves, what would Jesus do when we are faced with difficulties, difficult decisions to make concerning our faith, journey. But the only problem with WWJD analogy is that it's presented in the wrong tense. What would seems to convey the message that Jesus is no longer here. He's no longer with us. That his own activity was one that was in the past and thus should be voiced in the past tense. But Paul would say, but if Jesus is alive today, and he is, what about all the present and future decisions that are still in front of you and me? 
You see, by putting Jesus in the past, we run the risk of lessening the real meaning of Easter. But Easter puts Jesus right back in our midst, in our past, in our present, and in our future. For Christians who understand the life-breathing power of Easter, the question need never be a hypothetical, what would Jesus do? But instead, we might say, W-I-J-D. What is Jesus doing now? What would Jesus do is, is a question that maybe a mourner who is trying to preserve his memory would ask. What would Jesus do was probably on the minds of the two Marys as they went to the tomb to finish anointing Jesus' body if someone there would just roll away the stone. But all of a sudden they saw and they heard the message of Easter and the resurrection. And instead of feeling lost and helpless and sad, these women experienced the assurance of Jesus' resurrection. A new beginning, a, a new hope. One that totally changed their lives and has the power of changing our life as well. You see, brothers and sisters, if Easter was just about remembering that Jesus died on the cross, then our friend who opened up the service this morning was right. There would be a lot better ways for us to spend this Sunday. But you see, Easter is not about a cross. Easter is about an empty tomb. It's about... God keeping his promises of forgiveness and eternal life to you and me and to every Mary who has ever lived. Easter proclaims that Jesus is alive right now in our very midst. And so he invites us to recognize not what he would have done, but what he is doing in our lives. So let me ask, what is Jesus doing in our church today? Because of Easter, the church has the message of power and resurrection and forgiveness and new life that the world needs to hear. Because of the resurrection and Easter, the Holy Spirit is bringing the church together so together we can share the message of new life that can only be experienced through the risen Christ. What is Jesus doing in the midst of our families? You know, the Easter brings about it such a phenomenal power that changes everything. And I thought this morning that for our families, especially families where the marriage is not strong, or where their marriage has broken apart, that Easter brings the hope that those marriages can be put back stronger than ever before. Because of Easter, we have the hope that God maybe is working in the lives of troubled children, maybe our own children, and is in the process of bringing them back, not only to the cross, but to the empty tomb. Easter seeks to give to the family a sense of unconditional love 
and patience and goodness and forgiveness that will help bring the power of the resurrection to our families. What is Jesus doing outside the church, out in the world? Well, I want to tell you, I know you already know, but Easter is transforming that world. In my prayer this morning as I drove down, I found myself praying for the Muslims and the Hindus. I found myself praying for those we call terrorists who bring their message of death into the world each and every day that somehow Easter would transform them, their minds, and to save their souls. Because I know that's what God wants. Not only for the Hindus and the Muslims and the atheists, but those who are outside wanting to believe, and yet Satan is keeping them away from hearing the message, keeping them away from the church. And yet they see every day how Easter is transforming the world. We have ministries in this church that were set up to help transform people who were hurting, families who were hurting, to give them a sense of hope and meaning and purpose. Easter has the power to transform everything, including us. So brothers and sisters, celebrate Easter today. Celebrate Easter tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And next Sunday, we're not going to have a low Sunday. We're going to have another high Sunday because we're celebrating Easter. Not just today but for all the days that God has planned out for each of us. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is not dead. He is alive. He's risen. And that reality has the power to change everything. 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 In our lives. In the name of the Father, in the name of the risen Son, Jesus Christ, in the name of the Holy Spirit, amen.